I'm about to read chapter one of The Hidden Life of Trees. I'm really excited about this. I hope some of you out there will enjoy it and enjoy sharing it. I'll try and read one chapter a day over until I've read it all. And I um, hope some of you can keep up with me. I think it's going to be really interesting. There's so much going on in forests. Um, we often look at forests and trees as like one tree, one tree, one tree, and yet there's so much happening inside a forest. All the bacteria and funguses and all the different creatures and plants and how they work together and look at and cooperate. It's, it's just fascinating and I think this book is, I haven't read it yet, this is my first reading, but I think it's gonna, um, I've been told that it really reveals some really beautiful things and interesting things about the forest. Let's go. The first chapter is called Friendship. Years ago, I s oh, are you sitting comfortably? Good, then I'll begin. Years ago, I stumbled across a patch of strange looking mossy stones in one of the preserves of old beech trees that grows in the forest I manage. Casting my mind back, I realized I'd passed by them many times before without paying them any heed. But that day, I stopped and bent down and took a good look. The stones were an unusual shape. They were gently curved with hollowed out areas. Carefully, I lifted the moss on one of the stones. What I found underneath was tree bark. So these were not stones after all, but old wood. I was surprised at how hard the stone was because it usually takes only a few years for beech wood lying on damp ground to decompose. But what surprised me most was that I couldn't lift the wood. It was obviously attached to the ground in some way. I took out my pocket knife and carefully scraped away some of the bark until I got down to a greenish layer. Green! This colour is found only in chlorophyll, which makes new leaves. Green, preser um, reserve, reserves of chlorophyll are also stored in the trunk of living trees. That could mean only one thing. This piece of wood was still alive. I suddenly noticed that the remaining stones formed a distinct pattern. They were arranged in a circle with a di diameter of about five feet. What I had stumbled upon were the gnarled remains of an enormous ancient tree stump. All that was left were vestiges of an enormous edge. The interior had completely rotted into hummus long ago, a clear indication that the tree must have been felled at least four or five hundred years earlier. But how could the remains have clung on to life for so long? Living cells must have food in the form of sugar. They must breathe, they must grow, at least a little. But without leaves and therefore without photosynthesis, that's impossible. Not being on our planet, no being on our planet can maintain for a centuries long fast. Not even the remains of a tree and certainly not a stump that has had to survive on its own. It was clear that something else was happening with this stump. It must be getting assistance from neighbouring trees, specifically from their roots. Scientists investigating similar situations have discovered that assistance may, and may either be delivered remotely by fungal networks around the root tips, which facilitate nutrient exchange between trees, or the roots themselves may be interconnected. In the case of the, of the stump I had stumbled upon, I couldn't find out what was going on because I didn't want to injure the old stump by digging around it. But one thing was clear. The surrounding beaches were pumping sugar to the stump to keep it alive. If you look at a roadside embankment, you might be able to see how trees connect with each other. 
through their root system. On these slopes, rain often washes away the soil, leaving the underground network exposed. Scientists in the highest mountains in Germany have discovered that this really is a case of interdependence, and most individual trees of the same species growing in the same stand are connected to each other through their root system. It appears that nutrients exchange, nutrient exchange and helping neighbours in times of need is a rule, is a rule, and this leads to the conclusion that forests are superorganisms with interconnections much like colonies, like ant colonies. Of course, it makes sense to ask whether the tree roots are simply wandering around aimlessly underground and connecting up when they happen to bump into roots of their own kind. Once connected, they have no choice but to exchange nutrients. They create what looks like a social network, but what they are experiencing is nothing more than a purely accidental give and take. In this scenario, chance encounters replace the more emotionally charged image of an active support though even chance encounters offer benefit for the forest ecosystem. But nature is more complicated than that. According to Massimo Maffei from the University of Turin, uh, plants, and that includes trees, are perfectly capable of distinguishing their own roots from the roots of other species, and even from the roots of related individuals. But why are trees such social beings? Why do they share food with their own species and sometimes even go so far as to nourish their competitors? The reason are the same as for human communities. There are advantages to working together. A tree is not a forest. On its own, a tree cannot establish a consistent local climate. It is at the mercy of the wind and weather. But together, many trees create an ecosystem that moderates extremes of heat and cold, stores a great deal of water and generates a great deal of humidity. And in this protected environment, trees can live to a very old age. To get this point, the community to, to get to this point, the community must remain intact, no matter what. If every tree were looking out only for itself, then quite a few of them would never reach old age. Regular fatalities would result in many large gaps in the tree canopy, which would make it easier for storms to get inside the forest and uproot, the mo uproot more trees. The heat of the summer would reach the forest floor and dry it out. Every tree would suffer. Every tree, therefore, is valuable to the community and worth keeping around for as long as possible. And that is why even sick individuals are supported and nourished until they recover. Next time, perhaps it will be the other way around and the supporting tree might be the one in need of assistance. When, six, when thick silver-grey beeches behave like this, they remind me of a herd of elephants. Like the herd, they too look after their own and they help their sick and weak back up onto their feet. They are even reluctant to abandon their dead. Every tree is a member of a community, but there are different levels of membership. For example, most stumps rot away into hummus and disappear within a couple of hundred years, which is not very long for a tree. Only a few individuals are kept alive over centuries, like the mossy stones I've described. What's the difference? Do tree societies have second-class citizens, like human societies? It seems they do, though the idea of class doesn't quite fit. It is rather the degree of connection, or maybe even affection, that decides how helpful the tree colleagues will be. You can check this out for yourself simply by looking up into the forest canopy. The average tree grows its branches out until it encounters the branch tip of the neighbouring tree of the same height. 
it doesn't grow any wider because the air the air and better light in this space are already taken. However, it heavily reinforces the branches it has extended, so you get the impression that there's quite a shoving match going on up there. But a pair of true friends are careful right from the outset not to grow overly thick branches in each other's direction. The trees don't want to take anything away from each other, and so they develop sturdy branches only at the outer edges of their crown. That is to say, only in the direction of non-friends. Such partners are often so tightly connected at the roots that sometimes they even die together. As a rule, friendships that extend to looking after stumps can only be established in disturbed forests. It could well be that the trees do this and not that all trees do this and not just beeches. I myself have observed oak, fir, spruce and Douglas fir stumps that were still alive long after the trees had been cut down. Planted forests, which is what most of the conifer forests in the central Europe are, behave more like the street kids I described in chapter chapter 27 because their roots are irreparably damaged when they are planted. They seem almost incapable of networking with one another. As a rule, trees in planted forests like these behave like loners and suffer from their isolation. Most of them never have the opportunity to grow old in it any grow old anyway. Depending on the species, these trees are considered ready to harvest when they are only about a hundred years old. It's the end of chapter one. Hope you're enjoying. Join me again for chapter two.